Good afternoon, good morning, good day to you, wherever you might happen to be in the world. Thank you for coming to our webinar, Secure, System Security and Drone Operations and Ask Me Anything event. Uh, really excited to be here today. I'm really excited to talk about one of my favorite topics in the entire world, uh, keeping people out of computers or making sure that only the right people can get into certain computers. And uh, as we all know, drones are our favorite lovable flying computers. So really excited for this. Uh, this is the culmination of a lot of uh, a lot of questions that we've gotten from different customers, from uh, different regulators all over the world. Uh, a lot of people asking very specific security questions and felt like this was a good opportunity for us to really dig in. So uh, awesome. A couple of housekeeping things. First, if uh, we want to ask questions, we have the chat here. So feel free to ask a question. You can uh, follow up. We have Erica and Steve from our team who will be helping curate the questions and uh, draw uh, draw attention to which ones we want to answer, what we want to talk about, um, to make sure I don't miss anything because this streaming thing, uh, though it looks easy and there's all these kids making millions of dollars doing it, it is harder than it looks. Um, second, uh, I love all the follow up. So if we want to get on a topic or you want to ask, go ahead and hit it in the chat. I will do my best to answer everybody's question. Um, and if you miss any part of this or you want to be able to refer to it for management or senior leadership and you want to come back to it, uh, we're going to record this. So this will be available in perpetuity uh, via a link and we'll follow up with those links afterwards after the webinar is done. Cool. With that said, let's let's just jump directly into it. Um, first, a little bit about me. My name is Joshua Ziering. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kitty Hawk. Uh, we're a drone operations management and airspace management company. Uh, Kitty Hawk helps companies like Travelers Insurance, Shell Oil, and Boeing manage their drone operations programs. Um, we're venture backed. We were based in San Francisco, uh, but we are now a fully remote company with employees all over the United States uh, and in some cases the world. So, very exciting. Uh, everybody's adjusting to the new normal and uh, we were excited to be able to try something a little different with how Kitty Hawk runs. So uh, being a remote company first, obviously, is uh, something that requires a very serious security posture, particularly as you have people in different parts of the world uh, accessing different components and different systems. You can't just give lip service to security when you have a fully remote team. Uh, it has to be a first class citizen. Uh, my background is pretty eclectic. I have a degree in poetry. And uh, as a young man, I spent uh, a lot of time taking unscheduled tours of other people's computers. I did not go by my own name. Um, and then once I discovered model airplanes, uh, I realized that I wanted to be a crazy model airplane person and uh, spent the last 20 years doing pro model airplanes of helicopters, blimps, uh, airplanes. If you, you name it, I've crashed it. If you can break it, I've broken it. Um, and if you can fly it, hopefully I've flown it. So was really excited uh, when the drone revolution came along. I said, this is unbelievable, but this is in essence a flying Linux computer. And that presents a whole lot of issues. Um, so really excited about that. Cool. Well, let's just jump right in. We have some questions that have been submitted. And I'm just going to kind of go through and uh and talk about that before we uh really dive into the specifics here if you like security you want to learn more about security how to bring a security posture into your drone organization uh kitty hawk has a free white paper we've published a couple of them we did one on remote identification uh, to really give people a primer as to what that is how it works the different technologies used uh, we did one on security so if you have questions uh, about what are the basics how do i understand the fundamentals of running uh, drone operations in my organization in a secure fashion. This is a really good primer. Uh, this is not going to make you a computer hacker overnight. You will not get to adopt a cool new alias um, and meet people in dark alleys and swap floppy disks, but you will have a very good understanding of the requisite things you have to do in order to have a very baseline security posture. It's free. Um, we thought it was important to do this for the drone industry because uh, you know, instead of just building a company, Kitty Hawk is actually trying to build an industry and a company at the same time, which makes for a lot of sleepless nights. Let's go to our first uh, audience question here. So the first one is from Rhea Roberts. Thanks for the question, Rhea. It is, I'm interested in data security and analysis. Great. 
the first thing that we want to talk about when it comes to data security is what are we protecting? Uh, so in this, we want to talk about data classification, understanding is this data really important? Is it PII? Is it personally identifiable information? Or is it just pictures of a brick wall that's crumbling? Um, is that going to be under the same level of scrutiny that PII would be? Um, perhaps, perhaps not. Depends where the brick wall is um, and what's on the other side of it. So we always want to take into account what is confidential, what is public, what would be okay if it got out, what would not be okay if it got out. We want to differentiate, this is very important, what we want to store. So in some cases, we have customers, enterprise customers that say, we don't want to store that because we're worried about if it got out. Now, the chances are very, very small that the data would be exfiltrated uh, in a breach or in, or even accidentally, for example, but they don't want to assume the risk of letting that data out. And that's something we want to really consider. We talk about network security and hackers and computer security. What we're really talking about fundamentally is the idea of risk and reducing risk. And this really, if you know aviation, this comes back to aviation. Every time we get in an aircraft or every time we fly our drones, we are assuming some level of risk. It is our job as good pilots and operators to do everything we possibly can to minimize the amount of risk that we accept and undertake. But we also have to accept that no operation is risk free and we need to carefully examine how we're going to accept that risk. And that's really where a lot of the enterprises these days are thinking that, wow, drones are a great tool, but we need to be able to accept the risk that they bring into our organization, whether that's computer security risk, whether that's um, you know, physical risk of if it falls or hurts somebody or uh, flies through a window, we need to understand how do we reduce risk. So while we might be talking about uh, exploits and vulnerabilities and computer hackers, we really fundamentally are talking about reducing the amount of risk that data that we don't want to live in the greater context ends up uh, doing so. So once you have a data classification program in place, you suddenly have this really great uh, you have the words to be able to, and the framework to be able to say, all right, we want to have this data very protected. We don't want this data to be collected at all. It doesn't even need to be protected because we don't want it. So getting that in place, and this is not the kind of thing you're going to do as one person. If you're in an enterprise organization, you're going to work with um, IRM people, different folks across your organization that are going to help you classify this data. I'll give you an example of why this is a little bit nuanced and you probably want more of a committee than uh, a dictatorship in this regard. We were working with some uh, emergency services folks and they do search and rescue. Uh, and some of the search and rescues, unfortunately, do not have happy endings. Uh, and so if you have pictures of somebody who's deceased, that is now covered under HIPAA because it is, a, it is now a medicine, medical uh, classification of data. Whereas if it's just somebody who's stuck on the side of a hill, um, that's just a really weird selfie for later. So that classification of data was really important to them to say, all right, we only want to store certain things. And if we do store them, they're subject to these different regulations and oversight. Um, so it's a very nuanced thing and you're going to want to ask for help uh, from other people in your organization and other stakeholders to understand what you want to classify. Um, in terms of analysis, there's a lot of security analysis that you can do. And if you like network security and you're curious about, you know, what are the different ways that we can talk about this, um, definitely check out our white paper. It's free to download. But in addition, there's a, a lot of different areas of network security you can focus on. So really, you got to find out what interests you and what's applicable to the operations that you're doing. If, uh, for example, you are just live streaming your um your drone data. So for example, you are uh, want to inspect something with some stakeholders who are not in the country and you live stream it to them and it's an ephemeral data set. It goes away after it's used. Um, that has a lot of different security implications then. All right, we're going to store the images and then we're going to put the images in the cloud. Uh, you really want to understand your use cases. And so understand your mission, understand your data classification. There's a, there's a phrase in network security that I'm kind of fond of. And so it's related to understanding what we want to classify things as. So uh, it's the difference between network security and operational security. Uh, network security is putting a good password on risque pictures that you take. Operational security is not taking them in the first place. So understanding what you want to classify data as, 
and then understanding how we're going to treat that data once we have it or we don't want to collect it at all. Cool, I think that's a good primer here. Rhea, thank you for the for the question. Just give me one second here while I look at the next question. All right. This question, I need to move this so I can see. Are there new security risks for law enforcement officers and departments when it comes to operating DJI UAS? Ernest Edwards. Ernest, thanks for the question. Um, well, there's always going to be security concerns when you're dealing with nation state adversaries. And certainly there has been a lot of talk about this of uh, can we trust these actors? Is this product safe? And really, I think it boils down to a few things. The first is good operational security. Uh, I would ask you the follow up question of how do they know that you are a law enforcement officer? Are you signing up with, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, a, a .gov email address when you could easily be using a uh, Proton Mail or a Gmail address that just says drone27 uh, at gmail.com? Are you giving them information that they don't need? And this is really one of those things where, all right, we're worried about this, this threat, this adversary. And, you know, there's a lot of different classifications of adversaries, just like there's a lot of different classifications of data. Uh, when it comes to a nation state adversary, if uh, if you're a local police department, you should consider one, uh, is this is this threat beneficial for both parties? So if they were to compromise, um, you know, a no knock warrant, that would be a really bad thing if they knew that was coming and they were able to use that information uh, for, for nefarious purposes. But in reality, um, what are they trying to capture? So we need to think carefully about what is the use case and what would be the advantage of a nation state adversary doing something like this. So we use DJI drones at Kitty Hawk. Um, we use the local data mode enabled by default. So when you are in the Kitty Hawk platform, uh, their local data mode is a mode that says nothing is going to be going uh, anywhere other than where you point it. So all of the data stays within the Kitty Hawk cloud. And moreover, um, I always ask people to consider what is the threat factor? So let's just say that uh, a nation state was able to uh, put put bad software, bad code into a, into a drone. And those drones are widely available. All right. Uh, how much scrutiny is that code going to come under? So, for example, to get into the Apple App Store, you have to go through code review. Uh, the developers that then use your SDK, they review the code. And then you have third parties that can do what's called a uh, person in the middle attack. And the person in the middle attack is able to say, all right, uh, here's the drone, here's the, you know, let's go pretend to fly it. And you can watch every packet coming off of that thing. And you can see where it's going. So we've done quite a few man in the middle attacks where um, I hooked up the drone, we had it all set up and uh, we were able to see, yeah, this was talking to China um, or, you know, different, there's different drones, different brands, things talking different places. But um, when you enable this mode, it doesn't talk to any, to any other places than uh, than what you would expect it to. So there's different different ways to look at it. But uh, my thought is two things. One, practicality. If I was a nation state adversary and I had unlimited resources, I would probably not pick the most inconvenient threat vector that is powered by batteries, right? Drones are, they live for very short periods of time. Now the data they collect is valuable, but I would probably be more concerned with uh, compromising one of the workstations in the police department and then, you know, social engineering my way in such that I don't just compromise one drone, I compromise all of the information. You really have to consider what is the cost benefit analysis of any given attack. I'll use an example from the news recently. You might have seen that uh, Russia was able to compromise an American software vendor called SolarWinds. And SolarWinds lives on a lot of different servers. It's, um, it's a management tool. So they were able to go upstream to a product everybody uses. And these, uh, the SolarWinds agent is always on and it's on every server. So by compromising SolarWinds, they didn't just compromise one target. They compromised everybody. It's a supply chain attack. And, uh, that's really the kind of attack that yields a lot of, a lot of, big data breaches and big information for, for the adversary, um, you know, you got to ask yourself if a nation state adversary has all of these resources and all of these abilities, why would you pick the really inconvenient, difficult route 
of using drones. And I, I just can't get there with the use case. So definitely things to think about. And there are third party verifications. You can look at penetration testing. You can look at, um, you know, Kitty Hawk's local data mode enablement. You can look at, at uh, people doing these man in the middle attacks and saying nothing's nothing's going where it shouldn't go. So I think it's OK. Um, I would encourage you to use a secure platform like Kitty Hawk and the Kitty Hawk cloud to be able to operate in this capacity. But um, there are other operational security things that you can do, like operating in flight mode or obviously enabling local data mode. A lot of different things you can do. But again, who's the adversary? What's the benefit of them being able to do this and compromise you? And then how practical is it? It's and again, if you have unlimited resources and you want that piece of data, you can get it a, a million different ways. So uh, the key is what is the easiest way? Cool. So this leads right into our next question. It is how safe is the cloud? Should you go native or outsource? This is from Bronwyn Morgan. Bronwyn, thanks for the question. You know, this is a, this is a pretty timely question. There's um, a lot of folks that are talking about, uh, hey, you know, we can do an on-premises uh, software deployment for you, or we can host it in the cloud. And there's a lot to consider. But the one thing that kind of comes up over and over again is that when you have uh, an on-premises deployment or in, in your cloud deployment, that fundamentally means that you have to take care of that thing. It's like adopting a puppy. You now have to make sure that server is updated, that that software is secure, that it's getting updates, uh, that it is not being compromised from other things on the server, that every piece that that every piece of software that that software relies upon is also secure. Um, you undertake a lot of responsibility and a lot of risk. A lot of people say, oh, the on-premises stuff, that's great. Well, yeah, it's great because it passes all the risk on to you. It's, all, it's an awesome deal for the vendor. Vendor says, this is now your problem. Uh, and you get to contend with that. And a lot of people I don't think are really ready for the, the ramifications of that. These, these services, these uh, software needs care and feeding. So we have both here at Kitty Hawk, we have folks who want to run their own version of Kitty Hawk, and then we have the cloud. And uh, I always steer people towards the cloud. In this day and age, it's really matured and the security systems in place for cloud architecture are really good now. Uh, this wasn't the case 10 years ago where it was a little bit more porous, but these days the, the cloud architecture is really, really good. And there's third party independent ways that you can tell it's good. So uh, this kind of brings me into my next topic here is security certifications. and. Uh, you know, when you first look at this, you're going to say, well, what does the International Association of Accountants have to do with computer security? You know, uh, this guy, you know, this person does my taxes. They don't necessarily audit my uh, network security posture. How does this work? So there's uh, there's a few different ones. There's NIST, which is the government's uh, framework for network security. There's uh, SOC. So there's different types of SOC. SOC, SOC 2 Type 1, SOC 2 Type 2. Um, and then there's ISO. And that's the British Standards Institute. They all come together and they say, these are the things that we would want to see in a mature um, mature organization that is handling network security appropriately. And you know, you, you can see evidence of, of how this works or how it doesn't work. Um, there, there was, for example, in the drone industry, there was um, some folks who had secrets leak. And they, so these are passwords essentially. And the passwords were pu published, uh, they're available publicly. And this is just like handing somebody the keys to your car or your house and saying, have at it. Uh, a super unfortunate incident. And uh, as part of, you know, implementing a SOC or an ISO framework, you put in place uh, controls. So that's the technical term is a control. You put in place a process to make sure things like this don't happen. Uh, and this is an important notion of what is a control? Well, the control is if we only enforce the idea that everyone has to have a password, Eh, that's an okay control. Everyone has to have a password that's at least 16 characters. That's a much better control. So what these audits do is they go through um, this entire framework and they go and they ask you to show and demonstrate what are the controls that you've implemented in order to have this network security posture. Um, and then they compile them and they say, these are our findings. And you're actually able to ask your software vendors for this report. And this is really important. Um, you know, the drone industry is near and dear to my heart. I, if I had one wish, it would be that the drone industry takes security a little bit more seriously. 
So you can ask for a SOC 2 report. If they have a SOC 2 certification, you can ask for their ISO findings. Um, and this is a big document, I'm talking 40, 50 pages. They do this, this is what they, this is how they handle passwords, this is how they handle secrets, this is how they handle files and uh, customer data. It's exhaustive and uh, it's an intensive process. We're currently undergoing an ISO 27001 audit uh, because the FAA is now mandating that UAS service suppliers uh, comply to ISO 27001. This is a very important step forward. Uh, every UAS service supplier is going to have to implement the security framework. And as part of this, uh, imagine being on a Zoom call. We were we don't have an in-person audit, obviously, but we did three full days. Uh, and that's just for one part of it. It's much more rigorous than this, but of all right, can you show me your passwords? You're not showing your passwords. Show me your password policy and how this operates. Show me what happens in case you have a data breach. What happens if you find out somebody's in your systems? What do you do? What's your procedure for this? Uh, we actually had to go and do a full exercise. Uh, they left it up to us what the exercise was, but we do uh, disaster recovery or worst case scenario exercises. So uh, Kitty Hawk, you know, had a, Somebody got mad at Elon Musk and uh, put one of his rockets into the Amazon data center that we use. That was our, our tabletop exercise. And uh, so the hacked rocket destroyed Amazon. And uh, how do we recover from that? This is the type of mature security posture that you should be looking for in software vendor. Um, that, you know, it's it's crazy to think now, but just 18 months ago, somebody was in a room saying, all right, what would your company do if there was a pandemic and you couldn't come to the office and use your computers anymore? And I'm sure a lot of eyes were rolling, but uh, having those plans and having that muscle memory of knowing what to do and having the plan ready of, all right, we have a serious incident, we have a data breach, we have a data center destroyed, we have all of these different things. Having that ready to go, and you know what, hats off to whoever had the pandemic plan ready to go. Um, it's invaluable when you need it. And this is the kind of thing you should be thinking about for your organization. What if all your drone data just disappeared? What if all your drone data suddenly appeared publicly on the open web? Um, what would you do? Who would you have to notify? What would you do to mitigate the fallout from this? Uh, these are things you can take from your own organization, even if you're not SOC 2 type 2 or ISO or NIST. These are lessons that you can take and say, all right, you know, we need to consider the worst case scenario for this data being exfiltrated. What do we do? And oddly enough, uh, even though it's a scary exercise for a thought, you know, a thought exercise, this is the kind of thing that we've actually seen help get buy-in from stakeholders and organizations that need to sign off on drone programs. When drones are a liability and wait, you want to bring in an army of flying Linux computers to our security organization, uh, time out. Um, if you can approach stakeholders with, a rigorous plan of this is what we would do. This is our this is our exposure. This is our uh, attack surface area, and this is what would happen if this data were actually traded or liberated. Um, that's a really good way to win buy-in and, and turn what could be obstacles into advocates. So, great question. Thank you for that, uh, Bronwyn Morgan. All right, what do you see as your next plateau to be conquered with Kitty Hawk from Marshall Nielsen? Marshall, thanks for the question. Um, as always, we're thinking really far ahead here at Kitty Hawk. This is, like I said before, we're building a company and an industry at the same time. If the drone industry fails to take off, Kitty Hawk fails to take off. Uh, so we want to do everything we can to bolster the drone industry. It's why we do things like the Before You Fly app for the FAA. Um, that's, we power all of that. We've done over 8 million airspace checks to date. And uh, it's worth noting, we do not collect any personal data from the Before You Fly application. That's on purpose. We don't want personally identifiable information. This is a, a good example of us using operational security in practice. We truly want to give people the opportunity to have an app that doesn't make them sign up. We're not mining their data, their names, their email. We don't care who you are. We want you to have, have fresh and accurate airspace data to know where you can fly your drone. Operational security in practice. But uh, no, we're thinking very clearly about the future is not uh, dinosaurs like me who use their thumbs to fly model airplanes. Uh, it is it is my job to make drones boring and it is my job to remove people from flying drones. That is how we think about uh, what we're doing at Kitty Hawk. So the future is 
is largely programmatic and it's API based. Uh, we're building a set of APIs that's going to allow people to do really efficient drone delivery, to do really efficient remote identification over a network, to add security to their operations uh, in terms of live telemetry or uh, being able to broadcast even through before you fly. Hey, we're flying here. We're having an operation. We're delivering a package. We're, we're delivering a kidney. Um, please don't interfere with this operation so that the general public can go and look and say, hey, this is great. You know, we have we have the opportunity to know what's flying over us. And uh, it's really exciting stuff. But uh, the future of drones is not not apps. The future of drones is uh, it's programmatic and it's exciting. So that's what we're thinking about. And that's really the, the future we're working with our enterprise customers to build the idea that you should be able to have a secure enterprise workflow from start to finish that allows you to decide if you can collect the data, securely collect the data, and then move that data into the organization to extract insights and basically derive value. That is what fundamentally a drone program should be. The flying part of it, the operations part of it, the security part of it, that should all be handled and it should be blase. No one cares where the data came from. If your job is to analyze the data, you analyze the data and you move on. And uh, that's really how we're thinking about it. Great question. Thank you for asking uh, what we're working on. All right, this next one. How does one implement drone identification on existing drones that were made before the FAA ruling from Roger Collins? Roger, that's a great question. And remote identification has been a really hot topic, uh, both with the hobbyist side, my uh, my hobbyist brethren who, uh, who fly model airplanes and they're thinking, how do we how do we comply with this when uh, I sat in my basement for 10 hours building uh, balsa wood and, and tissue? How do I comply with remote identification? Um, as well as, you know, the average drone operator saying, uh oh, I just spent a thousand bucks on this drone. How am I going to comply? And well, there's a couple answers. The first is uh, upon the rule going into effect, the the actual identification part of the rule, while it's, it is a rule, uh, the identification part of the rule does not go into effect, I think, until 31 months. I have to go look at the count, but it goes into effect uh, approximately two and a half years after the rule was final. So there's plenty of time uh, for this, so don't feel pressure. And then two, uh, there's going to be third party modules. So you're going to be able to have a little, uh, I think of it like a, a tile or, you know, kind of along those lines, it'll be a little little box that you can place in your drone or in your model airplane that will uh, broadcast the requisite information in order to be uh, to be compliant. And there's a lot to think about there. You know, uh, the with this remote identification rule, there's a lot of stakeholders, right? There's government, there's police officers, there's uh, concerned citizens. How do we how do we know what's flying over? flying over us um, and you know broadcast is it is the easiest version of remote ID to implement um, it you know allows people to use consumer off-the-shelf uh, hardware to identify drones now that presents a number of problems uh, they will want to use unlicensed spectrum well, unlicensed spectrum means anybody can go broadcasting on it uh, and just the same way your Wi-Fi may not work that well when there's a million other Wi-Fi's around, the very the very same could be said for um, remote identification. And then, you know, on top of that, you are literally uh, saying, "Hey, I want to connect to this drone." Right? You're saying, "I want this drone to share data with my phone." Um, boy, that could present some security problems as well. Uh, I don't know if I want to go connecting to strange drones, uh, particularly. You know what a great vector to uh to attack somebody's phone if you had a a drone that was able to do something nefarious and everybody's asking you, know, you, you put a big uh a big red flashing light on it and it's you know got a disco ball hanging from it and it looks crazy uh and everybody in in the area is going and saying all right i'd like to know what that drone is connect my phone to it and every one of those phones now is hacked because of that that's a real concern so certainly a lot of considerations that way and then lastly, um, the unlicensed spectrum is uh, very low power. So uh, your Wi-Fi will not burn a hole through you. Uh, your Bluetooth speaker is not going to burn you. 
Um, these are very, very low power solutions. And as such, we have low power. You, and again, frequently, not always, you have low range. So how far away is that drone? How fast can you get your phone out of your pocket? What if I'm uh, intentionally, if I'm a, a nefarious actor, what if I'm intentionally swamping the radio frequencies? Uh, what if there's a microwave that is misconfigured or has uh, a bad solder joint and every time someone goes to make microwave popcorn, every Wi-Fi in the uh, neighborhood dies and remote ID doesn't work? What if somebody intentionally modified their microwave to make remote ID not work? These are the considerations that we have to think about when we're using unlicensed spectrum, consumer off the shelf hardware. And on top of that, because of the limited range, we may not even be able to do the remote ID. So here's this drone, it's going 60 miles an hour. Uh, that's a, well, let's just, let's just double check my math here. 60 miles per hour in feet per second. Yeah, that's 88 feet per second. So if you think about your average Bluetooth having a range of 400 feet, are you going to be able to get your phone out of your pocket and uh, be able to open up whatever you need to open up to connect to that drone such that you can identify that drone in four seconds? That's a good question. I uh, think I'm going to start carrying my phone in a holster. Fastest phone in the West. Um, so lots to consider. We're excited that the FAA is doing remote identification, but at Kitty Hawk, we feel that there's no reason uh, that you can't do a better version of compliance. And this is this is what's so exciting is we have all of this technology. We don't need to use, well, we do need to use obviously the lowest common denominator, right? You can do broadcast, but uh, we have enterprise customers that are looking to implement a network remote ID solution uh, that Kitty Hawk has. And we have a whole uh, article about this. You can read about our remote ID network solution. Um, why wait, right? We can implement it today. We don't need a regulation to say, you have to have network remote identification. Um, when you have technology that enables more information and better situational awareness, you'd be silly not to use it. So uh, definitely check that out. And we're looking forward to seeing some production implementations of remote ID in practice. I know uh, I can't wait to get my hands on one of the little modules or uh, see some some early hardware about uh, how remote ID is being implemented. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's evident, but I like to break stuff. So call me a lightning rod around here. I'm very good at breaking things and uh, let's see how robust broadcast remote ID solution is in, in production. Because that's really, the proof is in the pudding. Um, if it winds up that we have great implementations that are able to fulfill the need of law enforcement and key stakeholders to identify drones from afar, all of this registration works and everybody's able to correlate this data and at the same time keep people's uh, privacy intact, I'm the biggest fan. Um, but let's let's see it and let's let's put stuff in production. Let's stop testing. We're ready to go. Um, you can only do so much pontificating. So great question on remote ID. Thank you, Roger. Um, all right. So we have one here from anonymous. What security pitfalls should my organization's drone program watch out for? Well, this is a great question and. Uh, when I used to do uh, computer hackery things, uh, my favorite method was always the people. Passwords are really hard. Like you can't, cracking a 20 uh, character password, I don't have uh, six years to sit here and try every variation. Uh, but I certainly can get on the phone and uh, say, Roger, it's me, Steve, I'm from accounting. I forgot my password. And uh, I was wondering if you had it for me. Oh yeah. So when you're thinking about the biggest uh, pitfall, the biggest pitfall is always the people. It's uh, it's exciting and it's always interesting to see how users inside of a, especially a drone organization, uh, are able to find new and exciting ways to potentially have data leakage. And so you you might find out that oh man, I have the I can't upgrade my iOS. I can't upgrade my iOS because I have block breaker six on there and it's not compatible with iOS 14 and I'm not giving up my high score in block breaker six. And that's like, okay. Uh, so you now have an old version of software that now uh, we can't give you the latest security update. And because of that, you're now vulnerable to this attack and block breaker six just leaked all your data essentially because you refused to give it up. So, uh, it's, it's interesting to see the decisions people make when they're not considering data security. So 
really recurrent security training is always a good idea. Um, and even though it might seem like common sense, common sense can also be kind of uncommon. So uh, reminding people, don't answer weird emails asking you for your password. Don't, uh, for example, if you have a computer that is not supposed to go on the internet, don't tether your phone to it and put it on the internet. Uh, that would be a bad thing. So there's certainly a, a lot of different vectors, but I, I always think about uh, the people first, because ultimately, even when you have uh, a computer that's misconfigured, that misconfiguration came from likely a person uh, who either was not following the process, there was no process, uh, or they were not able to uh, correctly figure out what the process should be. So, you know, we can always kind of trace it back to human factors. And that's you know, when you look at aviation accidents, uh, aviation accidents, really a lot of the time in, in the modern era come back to human factors. So, somebody was tired, somebody wasn't paying attention, somebody said the wrong thing. Um, computer security oftentimes has similar, uh, similar side effects. You know, if you accidentally publish a password or you have a, um, you know, somebody calls up and I think I just gave my password to somebody who said they were Steve, uh, but Steve's right here. You got to be able to train that out of your employees and uh, having it. So, for example, um, we have we have customers that will uh, specifically look at the data in one place and then they will destroy the data and that's their process. And so they have a, pro a policy. This data doesn't move from this place and it only lives here. And if you need to show someone down the hall, you bring them over. Or if you need to show someone across the world, here's the process for doing that. Um, keeping your process very easy and really tight is key to making sure that uh, your organization doesn't suffer any pitfalls. And then additionally, think about your vendors, right? Every, every year, um, as part of our framework, we go through our vendors and say, whose software are we using? How seriously do they take security? And do we want to work with uh, these folks anymore? Uh, think about your vendors and think about their security posture and uh, keep an eye on that. There's certainly a lot happening and uh, nobody is immune, right? There are huge companies that are having problems with security that have, you know, budgets that start with B instead of uh, M or thousands. So if they're having a hard time with it, you could be having a hard time with it too. The, the joy of the drone programs right now is that comparatively, they're pretty small. We have drone programs that do... Uh, thousands of pilots doing hundreds of thousands of flights per year. That's a very manageable still amount of data and people. Um, and we're, you know, thinking ahead of, all right, great. When we have 10,000 people in a drone operations program, how's that going to look? What are we going to need to account for? Uh, where's all that data going to live and how are we going to make use of it? So thinking ahead, um, right in aviation, we have a phrase, never, never fly somewhere. Your brain hasn't been five minutes before. Uh, so definitely thinking ahead about what your risks are, how you're going to approach them, and uh, how you're going to keep your data safe is is key. So I always focus on people. Um, and the other thing that so as I'm as I'm thinking about it, the other thing that is very important, um, you really want diversity in your in your drone program. And by diversity, I mean if you have, for example, all one brand of drone, or you have all the same drone, uh, that pre presents something called concentration risk. Concentration risk is, uh, as the name suggests, when you are very vulnerable to, if there was a problem with this specific piece of hardware uh, or this specific vendor, you would be feeling that at great magnitude as compared to somebody uh, who had diversity in their fleet. So for example, um, you know, oh, here's this, here's a bad patch, right? A bad firmware, a bad whatever. It, it renders the drone useless. You update all your drones. Suddenly none of your drones fly. Uh, that's a problem for a burgeoning drone program. So uh, definitely having diversity amongst your, your aircraft and your, uh, um, your team is very important to being able to say, all right, we're prepared for several eventualities here um, and understanding that, you know, if you have vendor lock-in, by that I mean, hey, you know, you're stuck with this because you're linked to this, that's a big problem. Uh, you want to be able to, one, take your data anywhere. Your data is yours. If you're working with folks that are holding your data hostage and saying, you can't get it out of here, this is it, that's uh, that's terrible. So try not to work with folks like that. You want to be able to take your data. It should be yours. Um, and most importantly, your data should not be somebody else's product. And this is an important differentiation. 
your data should belong to you and it should not be powering um, anybody else's profit margin. Cool, good question. Thank you for that, Anonymous. Um, great, how does, how does security play a role in the future of UTM? This is a, a really important question because we need to think about UTM as not just how do we manage drones. And for those, uh, for those who may not be super familiar with UTM, it's uh, UAS traffic management or universal traffic management. And ultimately, UTM is the solution to what becomes an overwhelming amount of management for humans. We, as we increase the density of flights and of drones and of flying taxis and flying cars and advanced urban mobility and urban air mobility, as we advance all of that, the density starts to increase. It is not going to be possible to have enough air traffic controllers to handle this. This is the big problem. As part of this, we also want to make sure that everybody that's cooperating in this system is who they say they are. So we need federation. We need to understand, are, can we trust who you are? That is an important part of this because we need to be able to say, if Josh is flying, we need to be able to say, yes, it really is Josh. And yes, Josh is where he says he is. Uh, if somebody was able to impersonate me and say I was at two places at once, um, and then all of a sudden there's a glitch in the matrix and we have aircraft falling out of the sky, that is a really bad thing. Um, so security has to be a first-class citizen, citizen in any future UTM system. And as part of this, Kitty Hawk is very actively involved in trying to set up security standards and work with drone industry um, compatriots to say, this is really what we need in order to have a system that we can trust. If you can't trust the system, uh, you have a real problem. When we're in a, a real aircraft, when the instruments fail, the pilot dies. You have to be able to trust your instrument and we have to be able to trust our systems. So as part of this, um, there's a number of different standards, a number of different groups. We participate in ASTM and GUTMA and um, we just try to make sure that security is being thought of before the system is built and not tacked on after it's already been deployed. That does not work very well historically. Great question. Thank you for that. Um, great. Let's see. All right. Why is encryption important and uh, how is how are, how are different types of encryption different from each other? Great question. Uh, so encryption is really the idea of a lock and a key. Uh, you can, look, dress it up and you can make it super complicated, but if I want to um, have a piece of data that is not available to anybody else but me, um, but that data has to live in the middle of Times Square, how do I make it so that I'm the only person who's able to access that data and yet it's publicly available? That's really the basic notion of encryption. So there's many different types of encryption. Uh, Kitty Hawk uses something called AES-256. It, uh, it is a method of encrypting that allows us to have a key and then that key is the only way to be able to take that data and make it readable. You can think of it like, um, some of those, you know, spy letters where they, they don't make any sense to somebody who intercepts them, but with the appropriate holes over the, uh, the letters, you're able to decipher the message. And again, uh, encryption is only as good as the implementation. So if you have a bad encryption or your key is public or your key gets leaked, well, that encryption means nothing now if other people have your key, uh, just like the key to your house. So you want to think about what is the type of encryption and the best encryption, the best algorithms, the, the ones that Kitty Hawk uses uh, are all NSA approved. So uh, when the spies say the encryption's good, chances are it's pretty good. And then on top of that, um, we only want to implement security that is, we think that security shines best in the sunlight. Uh, so these, these algorithms, they're subject to public scrutiny, meaning anybody can go look at how this works. If there was some brilliant team or person out there who said, oh, I totally found a way to break this and I can, I can read anybody's encrypted message now, uh, they have the opportunity to propose a fix. And we really, uh, we champion open standards for UTM. We think that collaboration over competition is going to be key, not just for the industry, but also for security. 
Um, it's not going to be good to have a walled garden approach where it's difficult to get data across in a secure fashion and know who's sending what where. Um, so collaboration over competition and then understanding that open standards are always preferable, in our opinion, to closed standards. Uh, having the ability for many, many thousands of people, thousands of experts all over the world being able to scrutinize this process and this code uh, makes for a far, far higher quality product than uh, proprietary, proprietary information from one company. Uh, moreover, when somebody does find a problem, uh, other bright folks volunteer to fix it and then they disseminate that information downstream. And it's the reverse of kind of one of the attacks we talked about earlier, that solar winds attack where, hey, we found a problem, we've identified it, we fixed it, and now it flows downstream to everybody who's using the software. So with just about 10 minutes left, uh, I don't know if we have any audience questions. Erica, if there's anything uh, that we can, that we want to answer, I think uh, now would be a good time to turn to the audience. Take a break. I'm going to take a sip of my Arnold Palmer here. All right. Um, Tony Williams. I thought I heard somewhere that Kitty Hawk was a partner company that had a part in helping with the newest Mars mission. Tony, I wish. Um, no, we did not have any part of the Mars mission, but boy, howdy, did they do a good job. Hats off to that team for flying a helicopter on another planet. I'm, uh, I'm super impressed and just a little bit jealous. All right. Um, we have another question here. Did DJI use firmware updates to install remote identification? Uh, so that's a good question. They haven't to my knowledge, and this is a good DJI question, they haven't, to my knowledge, implemented a FAA compatible remote identification solution yet. They did have a remote identification solution uh, inside of their Wi-Fi implementation for a while that I think it was compatible with um, with their suitcase um, drone scanner. I, the name eludes me right now. Um, but they did have an implementation of remote ID. To my knowledge, it was not compatible with what the FAA standards are, are asking, simply because the FAA standards did not exist when they were implementing this. But the thought is, and according to DJI, uh, they said that some drones will be able to implement this via firmware, uh, which means that you won't have to add a little box on top of your drone. It'll just kind of happen. Uh, you'll be able to be compliant. Uh, I've yet to see them do it, and I'm obviously super curious like everybody else in the world to see how that works but uh yeah certainly there's a long history of people working on remote id in fact kitty hawk uh we worked with the inter uss program so this was a network-based remote id solution we went down to palo alto at google's headquarters and we all uh you know there's a ton of companies there all the usual drone suspects were there uh we demonstrated this in production to be able to say hey look at that there's a drone what is it oh it's uh it's a delivery oh it's a kitty hawk inspection drone oh it's and uh it worked really well and we we still think that remote uh network-based remote identification is is coming and it's going to be uh, a really big asset for the drone industry any other questions i i also uh thank you for coming to this i i don't know if it's evident but i love talking about aviation and drones and computer security. So this is a, uh, a complete awesome, awesome day for me here. I'm having a great time. So thank you all for watching and putting up with my blathering. All right, Eric uh, saying, could you please explain how Kitty Hawk's fleet management system compares in security standards to others such as FlightNow or Skyward? Uh, so well, we have a lot of great competition in the uh, fleet management space. And I'm not gonna talk bad about anybody um, there's a lot of good, good folks there and we know all those teams, we see them at every conference and, uh, you know, we're lucky to have such good competitors. Our security posture is pretty simple. We make security a first class citizen at Kitty Hawk. That's everything from the computers that our, our developers use to the software development life cycle, to the software that we've chosen to run our, our platform and the decisions that we've made in designing, uh, systems. And you can tell this is this is something that we don't hide. We're, we're very open about it. You can request uh, our SOC 2 Type 2 report. We think that security is 
absolutely paramount to the enterprise. So when you look at a feature list, does it do this? Does it live stream? Whatever, does it? That's not the question. Is it secure? That is the first question enterprises ask Kitty Hawk. And we've undergone some of the most rigorous uh, audits and uh, from private audits too, from customers or potential customers of, we want to do our own assessment of your security posture. Um, so I, I would just encourage you to check out our security white paper. Uh, I would encourage you to ask the vet, any vendor you're thinking about working with, if they are SOC 2 type 2, if they are ISO 27001. And, uh, and read the reports. If there's, you know, missteps, if there's misgivings, if there's uh, issues with implementation, that will all be in the report. So, you know, when we think about Kitty Hawk, we know that our customers, the enterprise, our customers, regulators, our customers are security conscious uh, first and foremost. And so it is our job to help be good stewards of their data, protect their data, make sure that it is their data, not anybody else's. So. Uh, security number one at Kitty Hawk. We do all our trainings. Uh, you know, we do surprise uh, surprise audits. We have all kinds of things in place to make sure that uh, security works. We also have uh, disclosure programs. So, for example, if some third party found something wrong with Kitty Hawk. They can go and say, "Hey, this thing is real broken. You need to fix this. This is a security risk. Uh, you should take a look and see if those vendors have that and if they take it that seriously." Uh, we're really proud of our security posture and. You know, we know that we're not, nobody's perfect, but uh, we certainly think that we try really hard and uh, I'm proud of the work we've done. So great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, as the U.S. defines remote identification, how is the industry addressing counter UAS security? Well, this is a, this is a really good question. I, I love this topic. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can do counter UAS. You have kinetic solutions you know, firing something or a net or uh, something physical to take it out of the sky. Uh, and you can have electronic solutions. And there's a number of electronic solutions that, you know, they take advantage of vulnerabilities in the drone's firmware or in the implementation of the radio, uh, the digital radio uh, protocol that they're using and make the drone do something or stop doing something. Uh, now, unfortunately, this is really tough in the U.S. because uh, the minute you start exploiting a vulnerability in that drone, you are essentially hacking an aircraft uh, and the FAA does not really differentiate. So uh, you can imagine how they would feel probably about somebody hacking a 737 while it was flying. Uh, same thing as, as a drone as far as the as far as the standards are concerned. So that would not be a good thing. And the FAA and law enforcement and DOD, they're all working on this. And, you know, what is an effective counter drone solution? And you know, ultimately, remote ID plays beautifully into this of, is that a drone that we need to even counter? Oh, no, it's, you know, it's just a person flying and we can go talk to them because we know where they're located. Great. Um, but there certainly are a lot of a lot of thorny issues. And ironically, very few of them are technical. They're more policy slash regulatory. Um, and it's a it's a fascinating topic. I would encourage you to go go read more about it. But you know, between electronic countermeasures and kinetic countermeasures, uh, lots of good solutions. There's a ton of solutions in the marketplace. Uh, the question is, what is the right solution given the regulatory environment? So with that, um, let's do one more closing question here. Cool. So Mark Thompson, do you know when you'll be back to answer more questions for us again? Thanks for answering our questions today. Mark, thank you. This has been a ton of fun. Uh, I would love to do these more frequently. This is this is my dream. I just get to talk about computer security and drones. So uh, I I suspect this will be uh, one in a series of, of how this works. And you know, I'd love I'd love to be able to just talk about drone and computer security in general on a weekly basis. Hint hint, Steve and Erica. Uh, but um, you know, I have other work to do at Kitty Hawk, obviously. Uh, but if you're if you like this kind of stuff, for example, check it out today. Somebody was able to hack a Tesla uh, and take advantage, take full control of their uh, in -fly, in, of their entertainment system. Uh, so literally, they hacked it from a drone. Uh, so this car drives under a drone, and suddenly this thing starts playing Rick Astley and blowing the air conditioning uh, at them. Really cool stuff. Tons of implications for car manufacturers, drone manufacturers, security. Uh, postures in general, I read this and said, 
I am really glad I do not have to contend with that today. Um, but as always, if you have questions, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, Joshua Ziri is my name. Uh, I tweet about uh, a wide variety of topics, but among them, aviation and computer security are always near and dear to my heart. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Joshua Ziering. And if you have questions about how to improve your um, enterprise drone security posture, feel free to send me an email, josh at kittyhawk.io, if you don't want it to be in the public sphere. And uh, if you're looking to bring some awesome software to manage a drone operations program and scale a drone operations program, uh, and to manage your airspace and to move your data through your organization securely, uh, definitely give us a shout at Kitty Hawk. We're building solutions specifically for the enterprise that make security a first class citizen and make workflows easy and approachable for everybody from the junior pilot to the executives who have to oversee the program. With that, I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one and uh, have a great Wednesday. Thanks everybody.